Welcome, everyone, to the first episode of Movie Burgers Sliders, where we cover a multifaceted topic in a series of small, easy to chew videos. For this first series, we'll be breaking down the various functions of one of the most beloved and useful elements in all of storytelling the foil. Foils are often the most liked characters in any given story because they are allowed to be the most colorful, charismatic, and just plain cool. They usually have the most memorable lines. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Why so serious? And the really memorable ones manage to find the sweet spot between being the teacher and the comic relief. <laughs> However, as popular as foils tend to be, it seems that their significance goes largely unrecognized. Until now. Officially, foils are those characters who serve the protagonists and the themes and ideas they represent by providing critical context and contrast throughout a narrative. They are the ones who provide the hero with a point of reference on things like morality or maturity, help steer them towards their destiny, or sometimes highlight their greatest flaws. Traditionally, they're meant to be the third point of the triangle involving the hero and the antagonist. Full disclosure, the foil isn't strictly speaking necessary to tell a good story, because the protagonist and the antagonist usually represent a pretty clear contrast by themselves, even if the antagonist is not a separate character. But this is beside the point. Foils are not meant to provide contrast for its own sake, but for the sake of providing nuance specific to the protagonist and to a story's overarching theme. What that nuance is and how the foil provides it is what separates one type from another, and it is these differences that we'll be highlighting as we go through each one. Okay, let's get started. We've already touched on the basics of what a traditional foil is, but because the type is so prevalent throughout history, hearkening all the way back to the Greeks, it's worth it to go over a few examples in full. To begin, let's examine one that most people are familiar with, Johnny Depp's Captain Jack Sparrow from the Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl. Without a doubt, Jack Sparrow, Captain Jack Sparrow, if you please. Sorry, Captain Jack Sparrow is the most interesting, fun, and charismatic character in the whole film. His verbose verbiage, wily intelligence, and bizarre gesticulations distinguish him from any preconceptions one might attribute to a degenerate committed to savoring the perverse and delighting in disorder. But as interesting as he is, he is not the protagonist. That title belongs to the young and petulant William Turner played by Orlando Bloom. William plays the predestined hero whose maturation from an inhibited apprentice to an autonomous leader forms the main arch of the film story. But the completion of this arch would be impossible if William hadn't found himself entangled in Captain Jack's endeavors, which directly involves the story's antagonist, Captain Barbosa, played by Jeffrey Rush. Indeed, Jack and William use each other for their own ends until finally a threshold is reached whereby William discovers which principles he's not willing to sacrifice for the sake of obtaining what he most desperately desires, namely Elizabeth Swan, played by Keira Knightley. In essence, Captain Jack is the personification of William's id, constantly demonstrating a lifestyle that appeases every man's patriarchal fantasies, not the least of which include the freedom of being led exclusively by one's most selfish desires, cunning with a sword, inherent authority amongst his peers, and a successfully casual sex life. Not sure I deserve that. Giselle. <laughs> and she? What? I may have deserved that. Well, maybe not very successful. Basically, Captain Jack is William's Tyler Durden. But unlike Fight Club's unnamed narrator, Pirates goes out of its way to make us aware that William is just as good at wielding his phallus, uh, sword, as Jack is, with the difference between them being that Jack is open to having any number of affairs, while William seeks the monogamous companionship of one girl in particular. The presumption here is that we are supposed to recognize how William's maturation is purely psychological and not sexual. Fast forwarding to the end of the movie, we find Jack Sparrow set to receive a pirate's death. Captain, Captain Jack Sparrow and Elizabeth still reluctantly engaged to a man whose upper lip couldn't be stiffer if it were starched. This is the setup we've been waiting the whole movie to see, where we finally witness William Turner turning the corner. With his attempted rescue of Jack, William formally divorces himself from the state of total obedience his legal superiors want to keep him in. Moreover, he exhibits his newfound appreciation for the concepts of individuality and descent that Jack symbolizes. And to top it all off, 
He proves he has become the man of action that Elizabeth has been wanting him to turn into since the beginning. If Jack's anarchic, egocentric lifestyle and the British Navy's world of law and order make up the two sides of the same proverbial coin, then the escaped attempt is William's declaration that he is capable of flipping between those two sides as he sees fit. In other words, he does what all of us must do at some point and he identifies himself as an adult. Thanks to Jack, William learns about the power of discretion and how his choices are only ever limited by what he is conceivably capable of. All right, now that we fully understand the most basic functions of foils and how they can seamlessly factor into a story's foundation, let's look at an example that utilizes those same basic functions, but in a different way. In Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight, we are again given a trinity of characters. The twist here, though, is that not only does the movie's villain double as the foil, but there are in fact two foils instead of one. How can this be? As you probably remember, in The Dark Knight, Bruce Wayne's Batman becomes excited that a new hero emerges by the name of District Attorney Harvey Dent, whose very effective and very legal methods of corralling Gotham scum suggest that Batman's efforts could soon no longer be necessary. For Bruce, the emergence of someone like Harvey is the exact outcome he'd been hoping for when he began his campaign against corruption. Enter the Joker. The Joker rightfully pegs himself as an agent of chaos, which is of course the worst kind of enemy for someone trying to secure greater order in a city on the path to civility. And to Batman and Harvey's dismay, the Joker succeeds in bringing mayhem to all levels of their beloved city. Worse still, Batman realizes that the Joker's presence was just as likely a result of his successful assault on Gotham's crime as Harvey, representing the inherent risk of fighting lawbreaking with lawbreaking. Violence with violence. Harvey is the half of Batman, that is, the symbol of Batman, that is capable of bringing order and prosperity back to Gotham and instilling hope in those who aren't yet corrupt. By contrast, the Joker makes up the other half of Batman in that his purpose is based on the ubiquity of corruption, using fear as a weapon, and flagrantly disregarding what feeble structure of civility still exists. And when Harvey becomes Two-Face, he becomes the embodiment of this split within Batman. But while he and Batman both have scars caused by the death of loved ones, Harvey's on the outside, Batman's on the inside, those scars affect them differently. Harvey, or uh, Two-Face, sees tragedy as evidence that chaos is the world's natural state, and so any consequences are the result of pure chance. Meanwhile, the fact that a part of Bruce will always blame himself for the death of his parents directs him to believe that tragedy, and for that matter most things, is not the result of chance but of the choices that he and everyone else makes. The Joker's presence in the story, and by extension his philosophy, everything burns, points out how easy it is to flip from one side of the coin to the other in this regard. To him, because everything burns, it doesn't matter how or when it does so, meaning the chaos that he causes has no real consequence in the grand scheme of things. So then, what Batman's apprehension of the Joker and preservation of Harvey's reputation ultimately signifies is the triumph of the idea that each person can make a difference in the world and that that difference, whether good or bad, will be the result of their choices. As we can see, both the Joker and Harvey Dent fulfill the same basic functions of a foil for Batman that Jack Sparrow does for William Turner. Only here, because the protagonist and the themes he represents are much more nuanced, the story called for two foils in order to clearly illustrate that complexity. Now, the number of foils a story has doesn't directly correlate with how complex its protagonist is, but what The Dark Knight helps indicate is that there are a variety of creative uses for foils that function on the same basic level as their more traditional versions. Okay, that's all for now, but stay tuned for the next video in this series, where we will be examining two more varieties of foils, those which change throughout the different chapters of a franchise, and those who are themselves the main characters. Be sure to follow along and accept my sincere thanks for watching. Take care.